Okay, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Um, Insha'Allah, we're going to restart. I welcome you all to session number six of our Hereafter series. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran a graphic imagery of the Day of Judgment in the Quran. Apart from the psychological and emotional aspects, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about some of the physical attributes of people on that day. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Abasa, some faces that day are going to be bright, laughing, rejoicing at the good news. And other faces that day will have upon them dust. Blackness will cover them. So this is something which is very dreadful, very scary. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also mentions the severity of the Day of Judgment in Surah Taha, where he says, وَنَحْشُرُ الْمُجْرِمِينَ يَوْمَ إِذِرْ زُرْقَى That day, we will gather the criminals blue-eyed. Now, we wonder how can your eye color change? And subhanAllah, research has found that eye color can change in rare cases due to injury or genetics. So some people may have two different colored irises from a condition called heterochromia. So this condition is known to happen because of injury or trauma. And as we know, one of the names of the Day of Judgment is al-qari'ah. Al-qari'ah meaning the striking calamity. So due to the horror of the day of judgment, the criminals, the sinners, will be so horrified, they will be so traumatized, that maybe their eye color is going to change due to that terror. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us, ameen, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us sakina on that day. So continuing our journey through the Day of Judgment, we will be the first nation to be examined. The Ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even though we came last in the chronological order, but inshallah, we will be the first one from whom the questioning will begin. Alhamdulillah, that too is a mercy because the more the delay, the more fear and anxiety it instills. So we will all be standing on the plains of Yomul Qiyamah and the scrolls of deeds will be brought forth. And the Mizan, the scale, shall be set up. Some of us will have an easy reckoning while some of us will struggle. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant all of us an easy hisab. Allahumma hasibni hisaban yaseera. So you will see the mushrikeen and the kuffar being taken to the hellfire. The time of crossing the bridge of Sarad shall come and you will see a barrier placed between you and the munafiqoon. And it's going to be a dreadful sight and your heart will be intense in its palpitations because you will not know if you will be able to make it through. So this walk is not going to be an easy walk. This beam balance is not going to be a fun ride. So you're trembling with anxiety as you take each and every step and you see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at the end of a Sirat making dua for you, saying, Allahumma Sallim Sallam. And you will see some of them will reach the end of the bridge and meet the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. While some of the people will fall off from the bridge to the pit of hellfire below. And seeing this, will add more to your trauma. So as you take a glimpse down, 
while walking on a sirat. That one peep is sufficient enough to horrify you. Why? Because this is Jahannam that you feared all your life while you were in dunya. The worst place ever created for the residence of sinners. The punishment of the grave for the sinners was just a promo. The horrors and punishments of the day of judgment for them was just a teaser. But Jahannam, it is an actual abode of pain and sufferings. We seek refuge in Allah to protect us all. So the question is, what is Jahannam? When was it created and why? Let us visualize it from the lens of Quran and Sunnah. So when was hellfire created? It was created long ago before our creation. Next question, who was the first one to feast their eyes on hellfire after its creation? It was Jibreel alayhi salam. It's mentioned in a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. قَالَ لَمَّا خَلَقَ اللَّهُ الْجَنَّةَ وَالنَّارِ When Allah created Jannah and Hellfire, أَرْسَلَ جِبْرِيلَ إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ فَقَالَ He sent Jibreel to Jannah saying, أُنْظُرْ إِلَيْهَا وَإِلَى مَا أَعْدَدْتُ لِأَهْلِهَا فِيهَا Look at it, what I have prepared therein for its people. قَالَ فَجَاءَهَا وَنَظَرَ إِلَيْهَا وَإِلَى مَا أَعَدَّ اللَّهُ لِأَهْلِهَا فِيهَا قَالَ فَرَجَ عَلَيْهِ Jibreel came and looked at it and what Allah had prepared therein for its people. He returned to Allah and he said قَالَ فَبَعِزَّتِكَ لَا يَسْمَعُ بِهَا أَحَدٌ إِلَّا دَخَلَهَا By your might, no one will hear of it but that he will enter it. فَأَمْرَ بِهَا فَحُقَّتْ بِالْمَكَارِهِ فَقَالَ إِرْجِعْ إِلَيْهَا فَانْظُرْ إِلَى مَا أَعْدَدْتُ لِأَهْلِهَا فِيهَا Allah ordered that it be surrounded by adversity and he said, return to it and behold what I have prepared therein for its people. قَالَ فَرَجَ عَلَيْهَا فَإِذَا هِيَ قَدْ حُقَّتْ بِالْمَكَارِهِ فَرَجَعَ إِلَيْهِ فَقَالْ وَعِسَّتِكَ لَقَدْ خِفْتُ أَنْ لَا يَدْخُلَهَا أَحَدٌ Jibreel returned and found that it was surrounded by hardship. He returned to Allah and he said, By your might, by your Isa, I fear that no one will enter it. قَالَ اِذْحَبْ إِلَى النَّارِ فَانْظُرْ إِلَيْهَا وَإِلَى مَا أَعْدَدْتُ لِأَحْلِهَا فِيهَا فَإِذَا هِيَ يَرْكَبُ بَعْضُهَا بَعْضَا فَرَجْعَ إِلَيْهِ فَقَالَ وَعِزَّتِكَ لَا يَسْمَعُ بِهَا أَحَدٌ فَيُدْخُلَهَا فَيَدْخُلَهَا Allah said, go to the hellfire and behold it and what I have prepared therein for its people. Jibreel found that it was in layers, one above another. He returned to Allah and he said, By your might, no one who hears of it will enter it. فَأَمَرَ بِهَا فَحُقَّتْ بِالشَّهَوَاتِ فَقَالْ اِرْجِعْ إِلَيْهَا فَرَجْعَ إِلَيْهَا فَقَالْ وَعِزَّتِكَ لَقَدْ خَشِيتُ أَلَّا يَنْجُوَ مِنْهَا أَحَدٌ إِلَّا دَخَلَهَا Allah ordered that it be surrounded by desires and he said, return to it. Jibreel returned and he said, by your Isa, I fear that no one will escape it. So yes, Jannah and Jahannam, they are real. Paradise and hellfire, they are haq. However, paradise is surrounded by tests and hardships. So it's not easy to attain it. While hellfire is surrounded by temptations and desires, so it is a test to avoid it. So on the day of judgment, the hellfire shall be brought close for its inhabitants. 
how will hell be brought on the day of judgment? The Prophet ﷺ said, hell will be brought forth that day by means of 70,000 ropes, each of which will be held by 70,000 angels. The next question is, how deep is hellfire? It's reported by Abu Huraira radiallahu an. He said, we were with the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and we heard the sound of something falling. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, do you know what that was? We said, Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knows best. He said, that was a stone that was thrown into hell 70 years ago, and it was falling through hell until now. La ilaha illallah. That's how deep is hellfire. It took 70 years for that rock to reach the bottom of the hell. Next are the levels of hell. And hell, as we know, it has different levels. The lower the level in hell, the greater the intensity of the heat, which tells us that hellfire gets more worse as you descend, while Jannah gets more premium as you ascend. What's the evidence? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, verily the hypocrites will be in the lowest depth of the fire, in the lowest level of the fire. Now, how many gates does the hellfire has? The hell, hellfire, Jahannam, it has seven gates. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us in Surah Hijr, and surely hell is the promised place for them all. Hell has seven gates. For each of these gates is a special class of sinners assigned. This tells us that just like Jannah has different gates and each entrance is designated for a unique set of people. For example, Babu Rayyan and Jannah will welcome all those people who used to fast a lot. Babu Sadaqa will welcome all those people who gave a lot of Sadaqa and so on. Similarly, in Jahannam, there will be seven gates and each entrance is designated for a particular class of sinners. Now the next question is, what is the fuel of hellfire? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us in Surah Baqarah, fear the fire whose fuel is men and stones prepared for the disbelievers. What else are the fuel of hellfire? Another fuel for it will be the gods that were worshipped in dunya instead of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Anbiya, certainly you disbelievers and that which you are worshipping now besides Allah are but fuel for hell. Surely you will enter it. Had these idols been ilah, gods, they would not have entered there and all of them will abide therein. So then you may wonder, what about the intensity of its heat and vastness of its smoke and sparks? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about this in the Quran as well. He talks about it in Surah Waqi'ah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, وَأَصْحَابُ الشِّمَالِ مَا أَصْحَابُ الشِّمَالِ فِي سَمُومٍ وَحَمِيمٍ and the companions of the left. Who are the companions of the left? They will be in scorching fire and scalding water and a shade of black smoke, neither cool nor beneficial. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned to us the fire as we know it is in dunya, is one seventieth part of the fire of hell. Someone said, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it is enough as it is. He said, it, the fire of hell, 
is as if 69 equal portions were added to the fire as we know in the world. Allahumma ajameen and Allah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from his enemies. So now the question comes up, does the hellfire, can it speak or see? The answer is yes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Qaf, يَوْمَ يَقُولُ لِجَهَنَّمْ هَلِمْ تَلَأْتِ وَتَقُولُ هَلْ مِنْ مَزِيدٍ on the day we will say to hellfire, have you been filled? And it will say, are there any more? So that tells us that hellfire is something which can speak. It can talk. Does anybody see hell in reality before the day of resurrection? Yes, amongst the mankind, the Prophet wasallam saw Jannah and Nar when he was traveling on the journey of Isra wal Mi'raj. It is mentioned in one of the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he said, I saw Jannah and I reached out to take a bunch of its fruits. If I had managed to do so, you would have eaten from it until the end of time. And I saw hell and I have never seen anything more terrifying. Allahumma ajameen min nar. However, as we discussed in our previous sessions, please note that after people die in Barzakh, the phase between death and judgment day, they will be shown their position in Jannah or their position in hell when they are in their graves. So the life in Barzah, it is something unique. Who will abide in the hellfire forever? The answer is the Kuffar and the Mushrikeen. Just like Jannah is the abode of the believers, hellfire will be the abode for evildoers. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this in Surah Al Imran, where he says, their abode will be the fire, and evil is the home for the wrongdoers. Next question, does hell affects this earth and its inhabitants right now? And it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari that once Jahannam complained to its Rabb, saying, Ya Allah, some parts of me have consumed others. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed it to exhale twice, once in the winter and once in the summer. That is the reason why you feel extreme heat in the summer and extreme cold in the winter. Now, what are the deeds that lead a person to hellfire? And the list is given to us from various ayat of the Quran and a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. The first one on the list is kufr and shirk. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Shu'ara, then they will be thrown headlong into the fire, they and those straying in evil, and the whole host groups of Iblis together. They will stay there in their mutual bickerings, saying, by Allah, we were truly in an error manifest when we held you false gods as equal with the Rabb of the world. So they will be regretful, those people who indulged in kufr and shirk. Number two, failing to fulfill the legislated duties as well as denying the day of judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us that the people of Jannah will speak to the people of hellfire. And it's mentioned in Surah Mudathir. They will say, ma salakakum fi saqar. They will ask, what led you to hellfire? And the people of Jahannam will respond, we were not of those who prayed salah, nor were we of those who fed the poor. But we used to talk vanities with vain talkers. 
and we used to deny the day of judgment until there came to us the hour that is certain. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us. Amen. Number three, inviting others to hellfire. So the leader is in kufr and shirk. An example of such a leader is Fir'aun. As mentioned in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, he will go before his people on the day of judgment and lead them into the fire. Next one, number four, accepting the invitation of misguidance and following their leaders willingly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about this in Surah Ahzab, those people who followed their leaders. The day that their faces will be turned upside down in the fire, they will say, woe to us. Would that we had obeyed Allah and obeyed the messenger. And they would say, O oh, Arab, we obeyed our chiefs and our great ones, and they misled us as from the right path. Next one on the list is nifaq, hypocrisy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Tawbah, وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الْمُنَافِقِينَ وَالْمُنَافِقَاتِ وَالْكُفَّارَ نَارَ جَهَنَّمَ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا هِيَ حَسْبُهُمْ وَلَعَنَهُمُ اللَّهُ وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ مُقِيمٌ Allah has promised the hypocrites, men and women, and the rejecters of faith, the fire of hell. Therein shall they dwell. Sufficient is it for them. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us. Ameen. And the next one on the last, on the list, last but not the least, is kibr, arrogance. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned to us, shall I not tell you about the people of hellfire? Every haughty, greedy, and proud person. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from all this. Ameen. So the question comes up. Now that we know the specific characteristics of the people of hellfire, is it allowed for us to say, so and so will be in the fire of hell? No, and oh, not at all. Perhaps the person who is outwardly appearing to be a non-believer may have said shahada within his silent heart right before his death. The angels may have heard it, wrote it, and witnessed it while we did not. Perhaps the person was a Muslim, but due to peer pressure, he was never able to verbalize his Islam. So we don't know. None of us can conclude the destiny of anyone based upon their outward actions, whether it be in a Muslim or a sinner Muslim. We should leave their case to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna rajula la ya'malu amala ahlil jannati fi ma yabdu lil nasi wa huwa min ahlil nar. Verily, a person may seem to the people as if he were practicing the deeds of the people of Jannah, while in reality, he is among the people of hellfire. وَإِنَّ الرَّجُلَ لَا يَعْمَلُ عَمَلَ أَهْلِ الْنَارِ فِيمَا يَبْدُو لَلنَّاسِ وَهُوَ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْجَنَّةِ And another person might seem to the people as if he were practicing the deeds of the people of hellfire, while in reality he is among the people of Jannah. So the answer is, وَاللَّهُ الْأَعْلَمُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best who specifically will be in hellfire. But for us, the lesson is that we should worry for our own selves. Whether we will be admitted in Jannah or not, rather than labeling others to be the inhabitants of hellfire. So the question comes up, are there any specific people mentioned by name as being one of the inhabitants of hellfire? And the answer is yes. Who are they? The Quran mentions about Iblis. He will be in hellfire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Sa'ad, I will surely fill hellfire with you and those of them that follow you all together. So you may wonder, how will the fire of hell harm Iblis? 
when he himself is created from fire? And the answer is, just like we in sun, we are made of dust. And if someone was to bury us alive under the dust, beneath the ground, it will definitely kill us. If someone was to throw baked clay or brick towards us, then this would definitely hurt us. Just like that, the fire of Jahannam will be able to harm Iblis even though he is created from fire. So who else? Quran mentions that Fir'aun, he will be in hellfire as well. Quran also mentions about Abu Lahab and his wife in Surah Masr. Tabbat yada abi lahab yun wa tab. Ma aghna anhu maluhu wa ma tasab. Sayafla naran zata lahab. Wa amraatuhu hammalat al-hatab. Perish the hands of the father of flame Abu Lahab. Perish is he. No profit to him from all his wealth and all his gains. Burned soon will he be in a fire of blazing flames. His wife shall carry the crackling wood as fuel. A twisted rope of palm fiber around her own neck. Who else is mentioned? A person called Amir al luhay al khuzai The Prophet ﷺ mentions about this person that he will be in hellfire because he was the first person to introduce idol worship in Mecca after the people had remained on the true teachings of Prophet Ibrahim ﷺ for years. He was the one to bring an idol and placed it right in front of Al Kaaba and invited the people to use these idols as intermediaries between them and Allah. So, who else is mentioned? Do we have anyone from the women? Yes, the wives of Nuh salam, and Lut. Salam. The Quran mentions about them in Surah Tahrim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He sets forth for us an example to the unbelievers, the wife of Nuh and the wife of Lut. They were respectively under two of our righteous slaves, but they were false to their husbands, and they profited nothing before Allah on their account, but were told, enter the fire along with those who enter. Are there any specific sins which are mentioned in the ahadith of the Prophet وسلم, informing that a person who indulges in such and such action would enter hellfire? Yes, there are. So these were the specific people whom we mentioned that they are in hellfire as mentioned by the Quran and the Prophet وسلم. However, for us, there are certain characteristics or sins that are mentioned by Allah and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that we need to refrain from. So what are they? Number one, some specific people who torture others. So those people who abuse others, who harm others. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, there are two types of people of hell that I have never seen. People with whips like the tails of cattle with which they strike the people. Number two, people who spread lies, rumors and scandals and they love to scoff at others. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about this in Surah Humaza. وَيْلٌ لِكُلِّ هُمَزَةِ الْلُمَزَةِ الَّذِي جَمَعَ مَالًا وَعَدَّدَهِ يَحْسَبُ أَنَّ مَالَهُ أَخْلَدَهُ كَلَّا لَيُنْبَذَنَّ فِي الْحُطَمَةِ وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا الْحُطَمَةِ نَارُ اللَّهِ الْمُوْقَدَةِ أَلَّتِي تَطَّلِعُ عَلَى الْأَفْئِدَةِ إِنَّهَا عَلَيْهِمْ مُقْصَدَةِ فِي عَمَدٍ مُمَدَّدَةِ Woe to every scorner and mocker who collects wealth and continuously counts it. He thinks that his wealth will make him immortal, 
No, he will surely be thrown into the crusher. And what can make you know what the crusher is? It is the fire of hell. It is the fire of Allah, which is eternally fueled, which mounts directed at the hearts. Indeed, hell fire will be closed down upon them in extended columns. And this teaches us the intensity and severity of making fun of others. It is not a trivial sin. Playing with someone's feelings and emotions and belittling them in front of others is a serious crime. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us if we have done this in the past, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from defaming anyone in future. Amen. So Islam sanctifies the honor of each and every individual, and we should honor it too. Next on the list are those women who dress up immodestly. The Prophet ﷺ said, women who are dressed but appear naked, walking with an enticing gait, with their heads looking like the humps of camels leaning to one side, they will not enter Jannah, nor even smell its fragrance, although its fragrance can be felt from such and such a distance. Next on the list is insincerity. Insincerity in seeking knowledge, giving charity, or seeking martyrdom. And we already discussed that hadith in session four. Next on the list are those who commit suicide. The Prophet ﷺ said, the one who strangles himself will be strangling himself in hellfire. And the one who stabs himself will be stabbing himself in hell. So the question comes up, many a times our youth, Muslim youth, they commit suicide due to the fact that they were bullied at school or because they were undergoing depression or some other mental disorder. So the question is, they were already suffering in dunya. Will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punish them in hellfire too? So let us remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a Rahman. He is more merciful than how you and me feel merciful towards other people. Plus, he is alimul ghayb wa shahada. He knows the seen and the unseen. He knows if the individual was suffering due to PTSD, due to depression, etc. So his case is special and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows it. So inshallah, he will treat him accordingly. And we should never ever try to conclude any judgment on anyone because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows all the circumstances and afflictions of his abd. So inshallah, he will deal with an individual accordingly. But what can we do about it now that we know? All we should do is number one, to make dua for this specific individual. And number two, we should educate our youth about the gravity of this major sin and educate them to find a resourceful solution that can benefit them in this life and the hereafter. Teach them to voice out, seek help from parents, mentors, and religious leaders like the imams and teachers, etc. And this is very important because depression, it is real. Do not undermine it. Do not trivialize it. If your child or any of your loved ones are suffering from depression or show symptoms of a mental disorder, then seek out help from counselors and psychotherapists in order to restore their mental health and learn coping skills, inshallah. So the next question is, who are the majority population of hellfire? And the answer is the woman. Why? Let us look into the hadith. The Prophet said, O woman, give charity, give sadaqah, 
For I have seen that you form the majority of the people of Jahannam. They asked, why is that so, Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? He said, because you curse too much. Because you are ungrateful for the good treatment. And this hadith is in Bukhari. And whether we like it or not, this is reality. Us women, we use our tongues too much, way too much, more than what is required. We backbite and we curse. Many a times, we are the instigators to add fuel to the fire between a husband and a wife, between a woman and her in-laws. We are at the forefront of discussing all the juicy conversations and spicy family secrets, and we feel pleasure gossiping about it. So let us note, let us highlight that this is not to stereotype gender roles, but to stay cautioned about specific actions which are despised. Let us learn to be more grateful for our blessings rather than complaining all the time. Let us learn to honor the privacy of others and follow the legacy of righteous women like Asya السلام, the wife of Fir'aun, or Maryam السلام, etc. Now the question is, what will be the size of the people of hellfire? The Prophet ﷺ said, the distance between the shoulders of the kafir in hell will be like three days traveling for a fast rider. And from this we learn that the body size of the inhabitants of hellfire will be magnified in order to expose them to more punishment. May Allah protect us all. Um, it's mentioned in Surah Nisa that the skins of the people will be replaced with new skins and the people will be dragged on fire. And if we go back in time, in the initial years of prophethood, when the Prophet ﷺ started preaching Islam, some of the companions who accepted Islam were brutally tortured and abused. Especially the ones who suffered the most due to their faith were the slaves. Their owners would place them bare naked on the hot sand of Mecca, heat iron rods and place them on their skins and drag them without giving them any food or water for miles and miles through the streets of Mecca. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is just. Just like his reward is destined for the patient Muslims, similarly, his punishment is severe for the oppressors they will be punished in the same way they punish others. However, the intensity of the punishment in Akira will be more intense compared to the punishment of the May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. What is the food and drink of the people of hellfire? Due to the intense heat and smoke, of course, the people of hellfire will be hungry, but they will have no other option but to eat this. And different ayat of the Quran mention about this. So number one, Allah mentions in Surah Baghashiya, لَيْسَ لَهُمْ طَعَامٌ إِلَّا مِنْ ضَرِيعٍ What is ضَرِيعٍ? It is a growing thorny plant. That would be one form of food that will be given to them. Second type of food, which will be given to them is mentioned in Surah Safat, Shajarat al -Zakhum. And this is a tree which springs from the bottom of hellfire. So indeed it is the worst type of food. Next one is Ghuslim and Ghassaq. It is mentioned in Surah Haqqa and Surah Sa'ad that this is the pus that oozes out of the skin of the people of hell. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. Amen. And when the people will feel choked due to eating this type of food, they would wish to drink something. But the only option available for them will be hameen, as mentioned in Surah Rahman. And hameen is boiling water. 
And the other alternative for them will be al-muhl, as mentioned in Surah Kahf, and this will be boiling oil. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. Um, what are the garments of the people of hellfire? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Hajj, they will have thiyabun minan nar. They will have clothes tailor-made for them out of fire. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Um, so the degrees of punishment in hellfire, as we discussed before, that hellfire is going to have different levels in it. And the least amount of punishment among the people of hell will be, as mentioned by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is going to be a man under the arch of whose feet will be placed a smell smoldering ember and his brains will boil because of it. However, the ones who will be exposed to the most severe type of punishment are going to be the hypocrites, the munafiqun. Why? Because they pretended to be Muslims, but in the secrecy of their homes, they tried their best to harm Islam. They tried their best to defame the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba Radiallahu Anhum. So the degree of punishment in hellfire will vary on the basis of quantity and the quality of their sins. A specific punishment is also mentioned for the inhabitants of the hellfire for a person who preached but did not practice what he preached. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, a man will be brought forth on the day of resurrection and thrown into the fire. Then his entrails will be spilled out into the fire and he will be forced to walk around and around like a donkey in a treadmill. The people of hell will gather around him and say, oh so and so, what is wrong with you? Did you not enjoin us to do good and forbid us to do evil? He will say, I used to order you to do good, but I did not do it. And I used to forbid you to do evil, but I used to indulge in it. Then he will walk around and around like a donkey in a treadmill. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect all of us. So apart from this, we also observe that apart from the physical punishment that will be subjected to people, there will be psychological pain as well, like depression, regrets, and sorrows. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Zukhruf, وَنَادَوْ يَا مَالِكْ لِيَقْضِ عَلَيْنَا رَبُّكْ قَالَ إِنَّكُمْ نَاكِفُونَ And they will call the people of hellfire, they will call out and say, Ya Malik, let your Lord put an end to this. And Malik is the guardian of hellfire. So they will request him to plead to Allah on their behalf. And he will respond, indeed, you will remain here. Innakum makikum. There is no way out for you. So this is indeed painful. And listening to all this, you wish to go out. We wish to go out, but we are not allowed to. So this will give them grief and the people of hellfire, they will burst into tears. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the people of hellfire will be made to weep and they will weep until they have no tears left. We seek refuge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from Jahannam. Amin. So after discussing all this, we may question, what's the purpose of creating hellfire? Why is it even needed? And the answer is given to us by Sheikh Ibn al-Qayyim. He says, the hellfire was created to frighten the believers and to purify the sinners and the criminals. It serves as a means of purification from the filth which the soul contracted in this world. Had it purified itself 
through genuine repentance, good deeds which erase sins, and patience for calamities which atone for sins, it would not have needed to be purified there. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no desire to punish his slaves without a reason. As he says, what would Allah do with your punishment if you are grateful and believe? So we conclude that hellfire is a place to oppress the oppressors, to grant justice to the ones who are oppressed. Like we know about Fir'aun in the Quran, he committed a genocide of thousands and thousands of people. One death sentence in dunya, will it be sufficient for him as punishment? When he is responsible for the deaths of so many innocent lives, when he is responsible for turning so many children into orphans, when he is responsible for transforming so many happily married wives into widows, who will give justice to all those people? It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now that we know that the punishment of hellfire is haq, and many of the ayat of Quran and ahadith, they highlight this fact, that it is true, and we believe in it. So the question is, is there any ticket for emancipation? Is there any leeway in this? And the answer is, inshallah, yes. In Akhira terminology, this special voucher is given to any person who said, La ilaha illallah. And this is called Shafa'a. What does Shafa'a mean? It refers to a request from someone, for someone, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In simple terms, it's called intercession. And many ayat in the Quran, they speak about the concept of Shafa'a. One of the famous ayat is Ayat al-Kursi that we recite every single day, five times a day after praying our Fard Salah. And in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, مَنْ ذَا الَّذِي يَشْفَعُ عِنْدَهُ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ Who will intercede to him except by his permission? So the intercession the honor of shafa'a will only be granted to one whom Allah permits from the believers, from a person who is a Muslim. So yes, shafa'a will be allowed for some specific categories of people, and it will happen only with the izn of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the question is, who are those special people who will request Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow them to pull out people from hellfire. They will be, there will be sinner believers who were Muslims, but they ended up in hellfire due to their sins. So who will make shafa'a for them? Who will intercede on their behalf? Let us see. So number one on the list are the prophets. Each prophet will have the honor to intercede for the Muslims of their own people. From amongst our Ummah, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he will make intercession for the people of his Ummah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Shafa'ati bi ahli kabairi min ummati. My intercession is for the people of major sins among my nation. So what will happen? Some people, they will be sentenced for hellfire for a specific time. However, due to the intercession of the Prophet وسلم, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes, their term of punishment will be reduced. So for example, instead of 100 years in hellfire, they will stay there for 25 years, for example. Similar to how it happens in dunya, leniency in jail, bailed out for good conduct. 
So this shafa'ah will be for the people of his ummah only. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will be able to do that with the izn of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Then there is a specific type of shafa'ah which is given to our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for one individual. Who is he? He is the uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abu Talib. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, my intercession may benefit him on the day of judgment where because of it, he will be placed in a shallow part of hell that will only reach his ankles, but will cause his brain to grow. Now the question is why exclusively for Abu Talib? Because we know that he was one of the best non-Muslims who served Islam in the best possible way despite his kufr. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow leniency for him. Then there are other two types of shafa'a which will be given to our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But inshallah, we will discuss about them when we talk about Jannah. So now, when we are discussing about hellfire and its inhabitants, are there any other type of shafa'a? Are there any more people who are able to do shafa'a for us? Yes, alhamdulillah they are. Next on the list are the angels, the malaika. What's the evidence? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Ghafir, الَّذِينَ يَحْمِلُونَ الْعَرْشِ وَمَنْ حَوْلَهُ يُسَبِّحُونَ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّهِمْ وَيُؤْمِنُونَ بِهِ وَيَسْتَغْفِرُونَ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا رَبَّنَا وَسِعْتَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ رَحْمَةً وَعِلْمًا فَاغْفِرْ لِلَّذِينَ تَابُوا وَاتَّبَعُوا سَبِيلَكَ وَقِهِمْ عَذَابَ الْجَحِيمِ Those angels who bear the throne of Allah and those around it glorify the praises of their Lord and believe in Him and ask forgiveness for those who believe in the oneness of Allah saying, Ya Rabb, you comprehend all things in mercy and knowledge. So forgive those who repent and follow your way and save them from the torment of the blazing fire. Rabbana wa adhilhum jannati adn allati wa attahum wa man salaha min abaihim wa azwajihim wa dhurriyatihim innaka anta al-aziz al-hakim. O oh, our Lord, make them enter Adam, Jannah, everlasting gardens, which you have promised them. And to the righteous among their fathers, their wives, their spouses, and their offspring, verily you are the Almighty and all wise. وَقِهِمُ السَّيِّئَاتِ وَمَنْ تَقِ السَّيِّئَاتِ يَوْمَ إِذِي فَقَدْ رَحِمْتَهِ وَذَلِكَ هُوَ الْفَوْزُ الْعَظِيمِ and save them from the punishment for what they did of the sins. And whomsoever you save from the punishment of the sins, that day him verily you have taken into mercy. And that is the supreme success. So this is an explicit evidence that the angels will make shafa'a for the believers. Other than the angels, we will have other advocates to intercede for us as well. Do we have any more defense lawyers? Yes, we do. And top on the list is Al-Quran. The Prophet ﷺ said, recite the Quran for what an excellent intercessor it is. The Quran will say on the day of judgment, my Lord, beautify him with the beauty of honor. And so he will be beautified with the beauty of honor. My Lord, dress him with the dressing of honor. And so he will be dressed with the dressing of honor. My Lord, give him the crown of honor. My Lord, be pleased with him. For there is not anything greater than your pleasure. SubhanAllah. And from the Quran, there are two specific surahs who will intercede for you as well. They are Surah Baqarah and Surah Ali Imran. The Prophet said, recite the two bright ones. 
Al-Baqarah and Ali Imran. For on the day of resurrection, they will come looking like two clouds or two canopies or two flocks of birds in ranks, pleading for those who had taken care of them. So this is something which we should recite often. Even if it is a page, we should make it a habit to recite it every single day. One page a day. When Baqarah finishes, start Al Imran. When Al Imran finishes, start Baqarah again. But this is something which is going to plead for us on the day of resurrection. And that day, we truly need someone to defend us. So who is your advocate number three? It is Asiyam, fasting. The Prophet وسلم, said, fasting will say, Oh my Lord, I prevented him from his food and drink throughout the day. So allow me to intercede for him. And the Quran will say, my Lord, I prevented him from sleeping at night. So allow me to intercede for him. And both their intercession will be accepted. SubhanAllah. <laughs> Who is your advocate number four? The extra units of salah. Yes, the extra units of salah. The Prophet وسلم, said, he used to say to those who served him, do you need anything? And on one particular day, one of those who was serving the Prophet وسلم, said, Ya Rasulullah hajati, I need something. He responded, what is it? And he said, Hajati an yawm al My need is, my request is, that you intercede for me on the day of Qiyam. The Prophet Sallallahu said to him, Man dallaka ala hada? Who guided you to that request? He said, Mayra. So the Prophet Sallallahu said, Fa'a'inni bi kathrat sujood then help me to fulfill your request by frequent prostration, by the kathra of sujood. And this is, of course, a reminder for us to increase our voluntary units of prayer. Let us aim to increase at least two units of prayer every day, apart from our daily fard and sunnah prayers. We can opt for salat duha which is prayed between shuruq till the time of dhuhr. Or we can add two raka'ah of salatul shukr to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his blessings. Or we could pray salatul istikhara for something that we feel confused about. Or we can wake up 10 minutes before fajr and pray two raka'ah of tahajjud every single day. It can be anything and we can decide it for our own selves. Whatever is easy for us, but we should do it. Because these salawat are going to be for our best interest on the day of Qiyamah, inshallah. <laughs> Advocate number five, reciting the dua post adhan, after adhan. The Prophet sallallahu said, Whoever recites this du'a after hearing the call to prayer, saying, O oh Allah, Lord of this perfect call and Lord of the established prayer, give Muhammad the wasila, a station in Jannah, and superiority, and raise him up to a praiseworthy position which you have promised him. It becomes incumbent upon me to intercede for him on the day of resurrection, subhanAllah. So if we make it a habit to recite this dua every single time after listening to the adhan, then inshallah, inshallah, we are hopeful that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will intercede for us. So we're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this dua to raise the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to maqam al-Mahmood. And what is maqam al-Mahmood, the praiseworthy position? It is mentioned in Surah Isra that the praiseworthy position which will be granted to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the honor of starting the day of judgment. 
the honor of going to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and falling into sujood in prostration and pleading Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, interceding to him to begin the day of judgment when the people will be exhausted, when all mankind will be depending on him. So this is called shafa'at al-uzma, the grand intercession, which is also going to be given to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Day of Judgment shall begin. So we ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to grant this to him, to our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we are hopeful that inshallah we can receive his intercession on the Day of Judgment. So now you may wonder, apart from the Prophets, the angels and your righteous deeds, are there any more people who are given the opportunity for shafa? And the answer is yes, the righteous believers. This will include the Siddiqun and the Shuhada. According to a hadith of the Prophet, ﷺ, we come to know that a Shaheed will have a quota of 70 people for whom he will be able to intercede to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Following them will be other righteous people. So for example, the ulama, the scholars, the hufaz who memorized the Quran and implemented on it, and other pious believers will be ranked according to their taqwa and good deeds. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant each one a quota of people for whom they will be able to intercede. However, we must remember, even though these people are granted the right of intercession, yet it's not a guarantee if their intercession will be accepted. And this is the difference between us, our religion, and the other religions, because we do not believe that these people are surely a source of our salvation. They are given an opportunity but the ultimate decision still is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He may accept the intercession or not. So yes, the righteous believers can do intercession for us as well to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What's the evidence? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Taha, that day, everyone will follow the call of the caller with no deviation therefrom and all voices will be stilled before the most merciful so you will not hear anything except the whisper of footsteps that day no shafa no intercession will benefit except that of one to whom the most merciful has given permission and has accepted his will. So that day, the day of Qiyamah, there will be pin drop silence, except for hums, the sound of the people's footsteps. And intercession will only benefit the people unless Allah permits it. Now you may wonder if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the ultimate authority, then What's even the use of intercession? So there are different reasons for it. Number one, it is a source of prestige for the prophets, the righteous and the angels. Number two, it is a mechanism to honor your good deeds. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow your good deeds to take a tangible form in order to intercede for you. Plus, it shows the ultimate power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he is alimul ghaib wa shahada. At the end of the day, he knows ultimately who will be forgiven and who will be released from hellfire. He encompasses all knowledge. However, this is an honor or a tool to honor others. So that's why a special privilege will be given to them, to these people, to these categories, inshallah. So let us continue 
the topic of Shafa. So as we said before, next on the list will be the white shoes believers. So yes, anyone from your relatives, friends or loved ones who was righteous, who had the taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they knew you in dunya, they may do shafa for you. What's the evidence? There's a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where he said, when the day of judgment finally comes to an end, the people of Iman will realize that some of their friends are missing. They will inquire about them begging Allah to release them from the hellfire, saying, O oh, our Lord, they used to pray, fast, and do hajj with us. Where are they? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to them, go and take out whoever you recognize. Allah will protect their bodies from the fire, and then they will be allowed to walk inside. They will enter hellfire and see people suffering in the fire according to their sins. The fire would have reached the ankles of some, the knees of some, the hips of some, the chests of some, whilst others will be almost entirely submerged in oblivion. Then they will pull out many of them from the fire. And how will they recognize them? They will recognize them from the places of wudu. The places of prostration, I'm sorry. And they will pull them out from the fire and place them within the water of life. Where their bodies will begin to regrow once again before they are finally allowed to walk into Jannah. Subhanallah, what a beautiful hadith. This is why befriending the people of goodness is very important. Keeping their company and sitting with them in circles of knowledge in halaqat is very critical. And for this reason, Hassan al-Basri, one of the famous tabi'in, he used to say, take as many righteous friends as you can for they will be given an intercession on the day of judgment. SubhanAllah. One of the scholars of the Salaf, Ibn al-Khayyam, rahimahullah, he would say, if you do not see me with you in Jannah, please inquire about me. Say, Ya Allah, one of your slaves used to remind us about you. I need the same favor from you as well. Allahumma ajirni min al-nar. Ameen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect all of us from hellfire. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect all our loved ones from hellfire, all our progeny from hellfire. Ameen, ya rabbal alameen. Last but not the least on the list are children. Yes, all those children who passed away before puberty will be granted shafa for their parents. What's the evidence? The Prophet ﷺ mentioned to us, مَا مِن مُسْلِمَيْنِ يَمُوتْ بَيْنَهُمَا ثَلَاثَةٌ أَوْلَادٌ لَمْ يَبْلُغُ الْحِنْفَ إِلَّا أَدْخَلَهُمَ اللَّهُ بِفَضْلِ رَحْمَتِهِ إِيَّاهُمُ الْجَنَّةِ There are no two Muslims three of those whose children die before reaching puberty, but Allah will admit them to Jannah by virtue of his mercy towards them. It will be said to them, enter Jannah. They will say, the children will say, we will not enter Jannah until our parents enter. SubhanAllah. So it will be said, enter Jannah, you and your parents. SubhanAllah. These children, they are going to be pleading to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They will refuse to enter Jannah without their parents. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow them to enter with their parents. Субханаллах.
Now, notice over here that the number mentioned over here is three. In another narration, there is the number two, which is given. So we notice that the mortality rate was higher in the olden times compared to what is now. The total number of children who died under the age of five worldwide used to be 12.6 million in the year 1990, which now has declined to 5.3 million, according to the 2018 report by the World Health Organization. So inshallah, we hope, inshallah, that if a person loses even one child in our times, inshallah, and he is patient over this loss, then inshallah, inshallah, this patience will be of value for him or her on the day of the end, inshallah. Before we conclude, let us remember that shafa is haq. Alhamdulillah, it is true. However, we shouldn't consider it as a free pass to commit sins. We cannot rationalize sins on the notion that it's okay, let me enjoy dunya right now because even if I end up in hellfire, it's okay, I'm a Muslim, so I will be pulled out anyways. I will be pulled out eventually and made to enter Jannah. This is how shaitan plays tricks on us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses this kind of mentality in the Quran where he says in Surah Baqarah, وَقَالُوا لَن تَمَسَّنَ النَّارُ إِلَّا إِيَّامًا مَعْدُودَةً قُلْ أَتَّخَذْتُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ عَهْدًا فَلَنْ يُخْلِفَ اللَّهُ عَهْدًا أَمْ تَقُولُونَ عَلَى اللَّهِ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ they say, never will the hellfire touch us, except for a number of days, for some days. Say, have you taken a covenant with Allah? For Allah will never break his covenant. Or do you say about Allah that which you do not know? So the honest truth is, we cannot bear hellfire. This is the fire which is 69 times more intense than the fire of dunya. We cannot endure it even for a second, let alone for a number of years. A'udhu billah. We seek Allah's protection against it. Amen. So based upon the above criteria, we learn that there are three conditions for an accepted shafa'ah. What are they? Number one, the permission of Allah to the intercessor to intercede. Number two, Allah being pleased with the intercessor. Number three, Allah being pleased with the one for whom intercession is made. If this criteria is met, inshallah, the shafa will be accepted. Until each and every person who said la ilaha illallah will be eventually taken out from Jahannam and accommodated in Jannah. So now this is the case of people who tried passing through a sirat but couldn't do so. Due to their sins, they fell down in the fire of hell. However, those people who managed to cross Sirat, what's the next phase for them? The next phase for them is going to be the court of defenses. What does it mean? It means that people will be gathered at a place called Antara, where they will present their stories, how they were oppressed in dunya and who oppressed them. They will try to sue them in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the others will try to defend themselves. There is a difference of opinion amongst the scholars as to the time frame when will this event take place? Before crossing the bridge or after crossing Sirat? However, this will be one of the aspects of the day of Qiyamah. So anyone who was oppressed he will have defense lawyers to protect him. Just like amongst the ibadat, the first thing to be questioned was salah. Amongst the mu'amalat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will question about bloodshed. 
that is going to be the first thing mentioned by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to be questioned. It is mentioned that a person who, kill, who was killed unjustly in dunya will hold his killer by the neck and bring him to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the scores will be settled between them. Number two, a person whose debt was not paid off. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, whoever dies owing a dinar or a dirham, it will be paid from his hasanat, for then there will be no dinars or dirham. And that's the reason why I remind myself and all of you once again, if we have any debt, let's pay it off before it's too late. If our loved ones who have passed away, if they owe any substantial debt, then let us try to pay it off because we do not want to exchange it with our hasanah when we need it most on the day of judgment. Number three, a person's ill treatment for his servants, maids, or employees. A man once came to the Prophet ﷺ complaining about his servants that they lie to him, so he beats them up in return. What is the ruling regarding it? The Prophet ﷺ said, on the day of resurrection, their betrayal, disobedience, and lying will be measured against your punishment of them. If your punishment is commensurating with their wrongs, then there will be no score to settle. If your punishment of them was less than their sins deserved, then this will count in your favor. If your punishment of them was more than their sins deserved, then the score will be settled against you. The man turned away and started to weep. The Prophet ﷺ said to him, Have you not read the words of Allah in the Quran where he says, And we shall set up balances of justice on the day of resurrection then none will be dealt with unjustly in anything. And if there be the weight of a mustard seed, we will bring it. And sufficient are we to take account. So this is the plane where scores will be settled. What does it show us? It tells us that even if you are destined to go to Jannah and someone is destined to go to hellfire, still the justice between you both will be established. And unfortunately, if we have wronged too many people, taken the rights of too many people, backbitten and slandered too many people, then God forbid, we will have to settle our scores. It will be an hujja against us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for our past mistakes. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to refrain from future sins. Um, so talking about Jahannam definitely instills fear in our hearts. But there is a beautiful hadith which gives us hope. And this hadith is beautiful and unique because it talks about the ability of Jannah and Jahannam to be able to talk. The Prophet ﷺ said, when a person asks for Jannah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala three times, Jannah pleads to Allah saying, Ya Allah, admit him into Jannah. If a person seeks refuge against Jahannam three times, Jahannam pleads to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, Ya Allah, Save him from Jahannam. SubhanAllah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect all of us from hellfire. So the question is, now that I know all this, can I save myself from hellfire? And if yes, what should I do? 
The answer is in the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, where he said, three eyes will not see Jahannam. An eye standing guard in the way of Allah. Number two, an eye weeping from the fear of Allah. Number three, an eye lowering its gaze from what Allah has forbidden. So the action plan for us is, let us weep sincerely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and repent. Let us lower our gaze and refrain from anything which is haram and repent. And we hope, inshallah, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive us. So with that said, inshallah, we will leave you with the cliffhanger for next week when we will discuss about the Hawd of Kawthar, inshallah, which is given to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We will discuss about the eternal meeting with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the entry of people in Jannah. Alhamdulillah, these two will be our last sessions from our A to E course. So hopefully you all can join us. And inshallah, encourage your friends and family too to join us as well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable all of us to enter Jannah and shield us from the health of all Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika, nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta, nastaghfiruka, nastaghfiruka, wa natubu ilayk. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana, wa fil akhirati hasana, wa kina adab al-nar. Allahumma anis wahshati fi qabri, Allahumma rahamni bil Qur'an al-azim, wa ja'alhu li imama wa nuran wa hudan wa rahma. Allahumma zakirni minhuma nasit, wa allimni minhuma jahilt, wa rizuqni tilawatahu ana al-layli wa ana al-nahar, let us not forget the people who have passed away, whose records are sealed, and they depend and rely on our du'as. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allahumma gfirli hayyina, wa mayyitina, wa sagheerina, wa kabirina, wa dhakarina, wa unsana, wa shahidina, wa ghaibina. Allahumma man ahyaytahu minna, fa ahyihi ala al-iman. ومن تغفيته منا فتوفه على الإسلام اللهم لا تحرمنا أجره ولا تضلنا بعده Oh Allah, forgive our living and our dead, our young and our old, our men and our women, those who are present and those who are absent. Oh Allah, whoever you give life from among us, give him life in faith. And whoever you take away from us, take him away in Islam. O oh Allah, do not deprive us of this reward and do not lead us astray after him. Amin sunameen. Allahumma salli wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.